Welcome back to the Ignite podcast. Today, we're delighted to have Michael Tippy on the program. He's a seasoned biotech exec, venture capitalist, and he focuses on life science startups, which is not something we do at Team Ignite. So we wanted to have him on the podcast. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you. Would love to get an intro from you for the audience. Sure. Well, I'm kind of a strange guy in the venture business in that um, you know, our model is to start companies from scratch, from university technology. So, for example, I cut my teeth in this business with a guy named Larry Bach at Avalon Ventures. So I was at Norwest Venture Partners, which is now a $12 billion fund. Yeah. Um, Larry probably is one of the premier, Larry's past now, but he was one of the premier seed artists in life sciences. He did 22 companies worth over $100 billion today wow. uh, using this model, starting them from scratch, being the interim CEO oftentimes, um, and building them, and companies like Vertex, like Neurocrine, um, and Illumina companies that are, you know, large multi-billion dollar public companies now. So amazing. It's hard work and it starts with science. I love that. So you start with science. So walk us through how you got into that. I mean, what was kind of the your origin story and uh well let's see. I so I started my career uh in the pharmaceutical industry under um a guy who went on to build build a very large company. John Martin is his name. He's he's also passed now. Um, but we were at Syntex together and um, in the lab that developed one of the first antivirals, a drug called cancyclovir. And that's kind of how I got the bug to, you know, combine science and business um, for the greater good. And, you know, hopefully if you, do, if you, you make good and do good if you do this kind of stuff well. Yeah. So let's, let's unpack the I'm a strange guy in venture a little bit because I like, I like that phrase. Um, what is, what, how does venture differ uh, and how is it strange and in, in, in where you kind of uh, dwell on it? Uh, well, first of all, um, most venture capitalists, I would say, are reacting to proposals that are sent to them instead of yeah. going out and, you know, talking to the knowledge creators yeah. and figuring out what is commercializable. So it's a very different way of thinking. Now, there are yeah. groups that that do this you know atlas third rock you know i worked with all these groups yeah um and they the very, bigger well-known names i know kosla does this kind of walks around stanford and right talks, talks to the students there and and right. writes five and ten million dollar checks into pre pre-launch pre-rev companies right that are just like basically like you said like a new it, it's technological an, breakthrough new science something yeah it's an idea usually with hopefully a patent application attached to it. Um, I mean, there's got to be something proprietary because you've got to have defensible space. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, there's good times and bad. There's all kinds of ideas being created at universities. Um, so our model is we put three to $500,000 in to de-risk something at the university stage, in, into a university <laughs> laboratory, typically. This is like and, some postdoc student uh, researcher who's now they've tripped upon something, right? They've in right. the scientific process, they've discovered some novel way of solving a problem. Right. And that usually takes a year, year and a half or so to, to, to hit, let's say, three technical milestones. The milestones usually are technical. And with that money, we want to show that, A, it's venture tractable. Um, that this can be reduced to practice in a venture relevant time frame. You know, we raised 10 year funds right. maybe with three years extensions. The pharmaceutical business is, you know, $2 billion in a decade to develop a drug. It's, it's already a force fit. So it has to be something that's venture tractable as opposed to, gee, you know, we should go write grants for the next 10 years. That doesn't right. work in the venture yeah. business. You know, we have we might to someday get to Mars or whatever. Like, it's, right. uh, yeah, yeah, that's a multi-decade I mean, thing. It's not it's, venture tractable. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. And the government should finance that because it's basic research, but it's not something that you can, you know, reduce to the time value of money, which we yeah. have to deal with in the venture business. Right. So, um, you know, once that, if they pass that hurdle, oh, and by the way, if the founders, the technical founders are not crazy, because there's a lot of crazy in this business, flip side of genius is madness. <laughs> <Yeah>. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. I love that. If they're not crazy, 
and the stuff works and is venture tractable, <laughs> then we'll go to the next stage, which stage, which is to put three to five million dollars into the company, put in one of our venture partners who's you know very experienced entrepreneur, uh, you know, who's an expert at this, you know, groping through a smoke filled house stage, and spend the next, let's say, two years getting to the point where we can raise a series A. And there's very, you know, very definite milestones that you need to hit to be able to raise a series A with the conventional venture capitalism. Yeah, especially in biotech and life science, that's a, just a little bit different animal. Um, I think in B two B software, where we tend to play, you know, your million to five million of ARR somewhere in there, growing fast. What does it yeah. look like? Let's revenues. Let's, yeah, are, what is revenues are irrelevant in my business? You, right, they're illegal. You cannot market a drug or medical device or diagnostic without FDA approval. Right, right. So revenues are completely irrelevant. What is relevant is Time to FDA approval, uh, the team, uh, the market opportunity, the competitive matrix—that is the you know the, the the IP, the monopoly space that you build around the technology to be a lot to so that an exit is possible at the yeah. future, right? So those are all the things that we we think about. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. So it's like the first quarter million check. Um, what is kind of that next milestone for that for that three to five million dollar check and call it the seed? So you got this pre seed check of two fifty. Mm -hmm. What is the milestone? You're trying to de risk the craziness you said, but what de else? De-risk craziness, what are... and then there's typically technical milestones. You, I mean, you have to design a series of experiments that will will turn this deal or this technology from gray to black or white. We used to say at Northwest, right? So what is it? What did you used to say? The, 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 we we used to say you, we need to turn this deal from gray to black or white. Either oh, I love that. Okay. Either pass. It's too risky. It will take too long. Or yes, it's past the hurdle. It looks like it's venture tractable. We can you know in the next three to five years we can get this thing to market to strategic alliances with a big company to something that will point the way to an exit. Mm. And then what are what are some of the things that you kind of look for in that first phase to write that next $3 million check? Well, again, it's a series of milestones that will lead to FDA approval or mm. or, or get you down the pathway. For, yeah. for a medical device, it had better be FDA approval, and that's a 510K or de novo, not a PMA, usually. Uh, if it's a pharmaceutical, you want to be able to get to an IND that, that is the first in human approval by the FDA to allow you to go into humans at the very least, mm. um, because the value inflection points in pharmaceuticals are very, very different than other, any other business. You know, when you, by the time you get to the clinic, there's maybe an eight, six to 8% chance of getting a drug approved, right? Are we talking about phase one trial yeah, approval? The, by the okay. time you get to phase one, there's a six to 8% chance. Wow. So you got all the way to phase one and it's still six to 8%. Uh, yeah. probability that you go all well, the way through maybe it's 10 maybe it's six somewhere in yeah, that range somewhere early yeah. so, very so, low probability so you yeah. better have mutually independent probabilities for shots on goal right i mean if you have three things that are dependent on the same thing it's like you're talking about portfolio construction from a venture capital perspective right, right. well i'm talking like, about yeah. a, a drug strategy that will allow you to get to some reasonable prospect of a, a drug that will be approved or be partnered. And to do that, you've almost by definition got to have multiple shots on goal. That's mm. why one trick ponies are, are very rarely financed in the venture business. So basically when you're assessing it, you're kind of looking at this new compound or new technology, new breakthrough. And you're, you're saying, hey, there's multiple ways to win here. There's multiple paths to revenue, to the FDA approval. Right. Uh, there's multiple well, uses for well, the drug. Yeah. So that devolves from the science by saying, for example, okay, this, we have a series of drug leads which act on a particular active site of an enzyme, which is biologically active. Okay. And these different leads act in different ways on that active site. So there's sort of several ways to get mm. to success, to yeah. efficacy. Love that. Yeah. What have, uh, you, you've been doing this uh, for a while. Like what, what kind of changes have you seen in this process over the last uh, decade or so? 
for two oh, decades or well, whatever timeline makes sense. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, you, you, I mean, I mean, you can't, you have, in order to take a company public, well, the markets are closed right now, right? Nobody's yeah. going public. Right. But when the markets are open, in general, you have to have something that is in the clinic or portfolio of drugs or medical devices that are in the clinic. It's not okay anymore to have an idea and a few animal, you know, a few mice studies and gee, we're going to take this public. Uh, -uh. that does not work anymore with the exception of a few bucket shop kind of highly risky things. I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole string. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it just, you, you know, or to support a public company in this space, you've got to have a lot, you know, You've yeah. got to almost by definition, you've got to have something that is very close to or in the clinic. What is the success rate? Um, you know, for B2B SaaS, uh, the unicorn rate, depending on what data source you look at is, you know, th- these are billion dollar outcomes from the pre-seed is one to 2%. Um, is it similar in biotech? Is it a similar kind uh, of hit rate or is it higher or lower? I, I, I have no idea. I, I mean, yeah. that's a function of, I mean, are we talking venture back companies? Are we talking? Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's take the whole universe of all I don't know biotech seed investments or pre seed. You know, what what is the likelihood to get to that billion dollar outcome? Because if it hits, it hits big, right? Like these are oh yeah, if it hits billion well, dollar billions of revenue, in, particularly yeah. in pharmaceuticals, it's big. Now yeah. medical devices, it's a little different because you've got an oligopoly of acquirers, and so that has depressed acquisition prices. So in a, in a biotech company, you know, a success is a you know, two to five billion dollar company, let's say. Yeah. And that's going to be a public company at the exit, most likely, or be acquired. Right. And there are lots of examples of, of exits that are bigger than that. But um, for a device company, I'd say a, a good exit is, you know, a three to five hundred thousand, five hundred million dollar kind of exit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are smaller exits. But in devices, um, they're not as risky. I mean, I would say there's, you know, 40 to 60 percent chance of success in devices by the time you get to the clinic. You know, their right. first human studies. Oh, interesting. Contract a little, the contra- a little more contra- de-risked. Yeah, so it's it's less risky, but the exits are lower, and you've got mm-hmm. this oligopoly of acquirers problem mm-hmm. that has made a lot of venture capitalists shy away from devices. Interesting. What are some um, medical devices uh, devices that did have a lot of success that we might know of? Well, the for example, I've invested in a heart failure company, and there's a, there's a company called that makes the Impella device, which is kind of the you know success story you talk about in this business. It's eighteen billion dollar exit. Wow, that's that's, that's but significant, true. yeah. Especially I mean, if you wrote the pre-seed check, right? That's right, and that breaks <laughs> my rule for you know uh, devices not being as remunerative as pharmaceuticals. That blows it all to smithereens. Right. Well, there's always <laughs> the exception, right? There's right. kind of the rule, the average, and then there's kind of always outliers. When you're writing right. that first two hundred fifty k into these uh, pre-company companies, is what you might call them, like what's the typical valuation? Are it's you getting an idea and a professor? You know. The valuation, well, sometimes you do it on a note because it's hard to set the valuation. Other times, you know, it, it, the valuation could be, you know, many of them one to $5 million pre. Yeah. That's typically pre-launch kind of valuations over yeah. in B2B SaaS land as well. It's like, oh, you got an idea uh, or, yeah, you got some new technology, but you don't have any team or revenue or product yet. Right. You're probably getting like a two cap, two and a half cap kind of valuation. Um and that's if you can raise any money at all. And that's typically we might call that over here on the B2B SaaS side of things, like a like a friends and family round or an angel round. Sure. Um, before before you get that first pre-seed, which is two and a half to call it 10 cap kind of range. Now you've got a product, you've got some revenue, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, tell, tell us about your involvement with uh, Berkeley Skydeck. I mean, I went, I went there for grad school. I think that's how we originally got connected. And mm-hmm. what do you see coming out of Berkeley? Um, that's exciting. Well, I mean, I'm I'm a biotrack advisor at the Berkeley Sky Deck. Actually, I'm spending a good part of the day tomorrow. This is really community service. You know, um, I don't have any financial involvement. It's um, you know trying to help 
uh, UC Berkeley and the Skydeck Fund, um, select and then advise companies. So typically, for example, I'm on the selection committee uh, for all the bio stuff. There's, you know, another, I don't know, 10 or so of us who built these companies that are in similar situations and try to help. Um, so we screen the initial decks that are sent in and, and score them. And then, for example, tomorrow, we're going to first round interviews so that there's, you know, 25 companies that we're talking to. They got 20 minutes to pitch. And then we talk about, you know, should we take this one? Should we take that one? It's and a lot once, of pitches. 20, right, 20 right. minutes times 25 companies. It's, yeah. You've so been then, there for a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's an all day thing. It's a marathon. That's like eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then once that's done um, and we make our selections, then, um, you know, Berkeley Skydeck Fund will invest, you know, a hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in these companies, yeah, and select a group of advisors. Okay, and I'm off. I'm an advisor to two of their companies in this cohort. I've done as many as four before, and there's three co three cohorts a yeah. year typically. So you know, you've got three months to try to help these companies, and you know, help get financed, help them with their strategy, help attract people, all this stuff. Yeah. That's so awesome. It's a, it's a lot of work for, you know, volunteer stuff, but you know, it's a way to give back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's that's always, and I've done a, a few of those as well over the years with the Alchemist Accelerator and a couple others. Where, and I have invested in a couple yeah. of the companies uh, that I have advised. Um, the rule is you can't get compensated or invest during the tenure of the Berkeley Sky Deck engagement, which is three months. But after that. You know, they want to do a deal with you. That's fine. What are um, some of the promising things on the horizon in life sciences that you're excited about? Oh, um, well, for example, the whole metabolics uh, developments, um, Ozempic, Mogerno, you know, these weight loss drugs, th those are life changing. Yeah, life changing. And yeah. I'm investing. I have many, many friends. Everybody knows people now that lost 20, 30, 50 pounds on. Right. Semi glutide GLP ones. Yep. So for example, right now I'm advising for Berkeley Skydeck, a company out of uh UC Berkeley that has, you know, one of these or, or family of these analogs that look very promising. Um, you know, they work on a different set of enzymes, but they're orally active, they're look to be non toxic, there's oh, extensive so you don't have to they, inject your, you don't have to inject, you can just take a pill. Right. Right, and, they, be, and they don't. Then they. It looks like they have, you know, many fewer side effects than wow. uh, the currently marketed drugs. So you know, you can imagine there's the the companies that are currently in that business, Lilly, Novo, and others. Yeah. Mark, Pfizer are, are keenly interested in looking at, at these things, but they're not going to do a deal with this little company until there's more data. You know, right. monkey data, not rats, monkeys. You know. Uh, a, a you start with rats and go to monkeys. Is that typically? Well, I mean, it depends <laughs> on the it depends on the drug system and what is the accepted animal model. It could be I've worked on projects where the accepted animal model is pigs, sheep, dogs. I, I also my the company I used mm. to run. Um, you know, we had data in five hundred monkeys at the Primate Center in Oregon. So oh. you know, yeah, monkeys are pretty good. Monkeys are really really expensive. They're more right. expensive than graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> but the data is really, really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, right. So, um, yeah. yeah I mean, we've that's... all been waiting for this diet pill, right? I mean, you know, we've had uh, false profits in this space now for decades, right? That turns out like it harms your heart and, right. you know, or, or whatever. And, and so we finally yeah, have the thing fan where, crisis, right. the, yeah, all that stuff that happened in the yeah. 70s and 80s. So yeah. we seem now to finally have this weight loss drug that is a, like a magical cure to lots of maladies that are imposed by our Western society. It's a really exciting time. Yeah. So that's an area that, you know, for example, five, seven years ago, I wouldn't have been able to get pharmaceutical interest in a metabolomics project. Mm. There's all kinds of interest now, believe me. <laughs> you know what's interesting about the semaglutide? Because I looked into it because I'd like to lose everyone would like to lose a little weight. Um, uh -huh. You know, the pharmacy's like, well, we can go with the Ozempic, but it's a thousand a month. Um, or we do this compound where we just take the semaglutide and kind of mix it with some like B vitamins and it's two seventy a month. 
why, why can they do that? Like, what, what, what's the patent law around around this and ge uh, generics I, and I, compounds? And actually, I, I'm I don't think I'm qualified to speak on that because I'm not sure why that's legal. I'm I'm sure <laughs> that Novo has a patent on semaglutide. I mean, yeah. when I read the report in the New England Journal, I was thinking, holy shit, this is this is revolutionary. Yeah. That wasn't that long ago. So, I mean, how long do you get a patent for? So, like, I, I discover a compound. I think it's promising. I file the patent. You know, what's the, what's the, is it 20 years, 25 yeah. years? What's the clock on it? Yeah, 20 years. Um, with, I mean, if you have sophistication, you can do product line extensions and, um, you know, extend that patent franchise. But that's absolutely critical because, I mean, the minute a drug goes generic, you know, it, the price goes down by a factor. That's yeah, aspirin, 10. basically. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, drug companies work very hard to try to keep, um, you know, monopoly position as long as possible. Yeah. Now, one could argue that's not in society's best interest because, I mean, when you run the numbers about how many people are obese, right? Everybody taking semaglutide at a thousand bucks a month. You, I mean, it's yeah, like gross we're natural product. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's another yeah, reason have to, to have yeah. other entrants in the field. Hopefully, they'll get some competition, you know, reduce the, the, the price point. Um, that's what, uh, like, the government, I, I, I read a headline. I don't even think I read the article on this one. I just saw it in my Google feed or whatever, but it was uh, economists are studying the GDP impacts of Ozempic, whereas people are living longer, having less disease. And being more productive and paying more taxes, right? Because they're healthier. So right. yeah, you have to kind of like, as a government, you kind of kind of go, well, maybe. But let's see, a yeah. third of us are obese. A mm. thousand bucks a month. Run those numbers real quick. It, it's, it's, it's a lot. Scary. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a hundred million times a thousand. Whatever. Yeah. Right. That. Right. Right. It's right. A, it's, a, it's a big number per per month. Right. Um, right. So, so I mean, yeah. I, on on the device side, I'm very I'm very excited about um, some things. Like for example, I've been I invested in the last year in a company in, involved with heart failure. They've got a device that is now in human beings, uh, being in the first in man studies in Europe, um, and it's shown a thirty to forty percent increase in ejection fraction in these critically ill heart failure patients. Mm. That's a situation where the drug treatment is in many cases, not satisfactory. I mean, you're, you're on a witch's brew of drugs. I mean, I have, I have a family member who died, but, but, you know, had this disease. And I saw the progress and it's a nightmare. I mean, you're in the OR, I mean, you're in the, in the ER periodically, urgent care, adjusting all this, you know, these 10 yeah. different drugs you got to take, diuretics and beta, and, and it's, it's not well managed using pharmaceuticals mm. currently. So that is a good argument for a device approach, and this one's pretty interesting. Interesting. Um, I mean, so a thirty percent increase in heart fraction. In, in what, what is that uh, for, for non -tech, non yeah, biological that, that technical means people? The difference yeah. between barely being able to get up to go to the bathroom and being able to do normal activities of wow. walk around your house. So your your heart now can just pump enough blood for you to live a normal life versus right. like well, I, I mean, get tired just getting up. Right. Exactly. So wow. that's a big improvement in quality of life, in productivity, in, I mean, in my view, certainly investing at the stage I do, you have to see these big improvements. It can't be mm. incremental. It has to be revolutionary. Um, and attacking some unmet problem in medicine, providing a solution to justify the, the very large risk you take investing where I do. Yeah. What do, you, do you think? Um, but I want to. I want to return to the patent question a bit because you talked about timelines from a patent being twenty years, and I want to talk about the extension and, and figure out what that is. But first, let's talk about the semaglutide, for instance. They when did they file that patent, and how many years did they have left, and uh, how long well, does it take to get through all the FDA approvals? Uh, and how what what is that window of profitability then for these biotech companies? Well, that's a good question. That's a very individualized answer because. How long it takes to, to get through the FDA process depends on the difference between how you power the study. 
right? So, so it comes straight out of statistics, right? If you have mm. a large difference between control and test, you need fewer samples to get statistical significance. You, you got a better right? p-value, basically. Right. But if you have a very narrow difference, then you need large. That's why, like a lot of um, cardiac drugs, you know, there's narrow therapeutic mm. difference. You know, you need 10, 20, 50,000 patients. I mean, Pfizer can't afford that. I mean, yeah. a little biotech company, good luck. <laughs> yeah. And so you're kind of looking at this as an investor in the earliest, like somebody probably looked at some of glutide and it's like, whoa, that is really effective. And let's go, let's get after it. <laughs> right. Right. And of course it has to be safe too. So, you know, it, yeah. I mean, it could be effective so as all get out. If it poisons yeah, somebody, then, that's yeah. no good. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and there's a whole series of preclinical, you know, experiments you have to do, pharmacology, toxicology, fate and distribution, metabolism, all that stuff has to be done. You know, we do not put poison in people to test. Mm. No, you don't yeah. do that anywhere in the world. Nowhere. Right. And so what the animal choice here is usually like mice to start? Usually rodents to start. Um, rodents, yeah. And then some larger animal, the FDA requires two species at the least in order to um, present, mm. uh, you know. Like a, lambs uh, or goats, like bigger, bigger animals. Yeah, it just depends. I mean, yeah. for example, in cardiac, you know, you often use pigs because their heart is actually fairly similar to ours. Wow. And uh, sheep, no. Dogs, not so good. Pigs, mm. really good. Mm. But it, if, if difference between it depends on the disease state and the accepted yeah. animal models. So let's get, let's return to the patent question. So semaglutide is up in 20 years. Um, you know, typically, you know, sometimes you, what's the fastest you can get through FDA approval versus like kind of the longest for a su successful drug that, you know, what's that kind of time range? Well, gee, I mean, it depends. If it depends on whether you're talking devices or, or, or drugs. For devices, you can do a 510K, which is basically saying there's a, a predicate device that is similar and has been approved. You can piggyback on that and get those through in six months. I mean, mm. you got to do probably a year, at, at least a year. Of Interesting. Work. So you got a longer profitability window with that patent on that, that novel device right. it could be you could have a 18 19 year window there of profitability right. where nobody right. can copy you mm -hmm. although i would argue that patents are stronger in pharmaceuticals because you're looking at composition of matter a unique chemical entity as opposed to a device thing which one could maybe engineer around mm -hmm. uh and yeah. patent around yeah. um so you know it's i mean you need a patent to analyze this stuff it's yeah it's complicated <laughs> which i'm sure as a as a venture investor you have you know your team right you you have people oh, yeah. looking at that yeah oh, i yeah. mean we work routinely with a patent agent um and you know who's you know well trained in science and on the law and then you know before we would do a deal we'll do a, a deep dive with a patent attorney yeah. and what about you know, on, the, uh, on the drug side so what's the fastest and what's the kind of the longest that makes sense the longest that you can remember? Oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, typically, the deals I'm looking at, you're looking at least two years of preclinical work. And that's typically when you come to those projects, there's been a, a lot of academic work. There may be rodent work. There may be, you know, uh, pharmacology, toxicology. It's been done in the university, okay, already. That could have been on grants, could have been for 10 years, right? But at the point at which there's, you know, it looks like it might actually be a drug. Mm. You're looking at at least two years of preclinical work, typically, mm. um, before you can get to the clinic. And then in the clinic, uh, you know, there's three phases. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is safety, by and large, in fairly small studies. These are, you know, 10 to 50 patients. Um, and phase two is efficacy. Um, and phase three is is larger studies in dose ranging. So, so probability. See, this is this gets to why drugs are so difficult. Probability of success in phase one is about two thirds, about six, 67, 70 percent. Probability of success in phase two is about thirty percent. 
Wow. And these probabil okay. probabilities multiply, right? That's so you get correct. two thirds times one third now. That's yeah. correct. Probably <laughs> get through phase three is about 80%. So you can see that phase two yeah. probability is the, is the hurdle. And that's why the overall success rate is only six to 10%. It's because you've got this, you know, it's this nested series of probabilities with a, a very low number in the middle. Yeah. People so get upset about the, the, the cost of these prescriptions and drugs and, and devices. But I, th I think what people fail to realize is all the research money that went into creating this uh, and yeah, all, all the failure, all the failed dead ends. Yeah. You have to recoup uh, all that R&D. I mean, look, when, when I was at MIT, we, we modeled the pharmaceutical industry based on equations that were developed for wildcatting for oil, mm. right? This is incredibly risky stuff. And the thing is, is you, I mean, the, the money spent goes up like this. And then mm. you've got this low probability event in the middle. So, uh, I mean, look, if I came to you and told you, I got a great business idea, right? All you got to do is spend, you know, $2 billion in, a, in 10 years, and you got a 6% chance of developing a, a drug. You'd say you're out of your mind, right? <laughs> From a conventional investment point of view. Why would anybody do yeah. that? Not a single one. Yeah, I wouldn't do. You have to as a as a VC or like invest in dozens, if not hundreds, of these things over right. the years. So, so to make it make sense, right? Yeah. So for a company like like Merck or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, so as an investor, you're not looking at ultimate success in the marketplace as the metric. Your metric for exit is when a big drug company takes it over, right? Because there's typically, you know, a strategic alliance involved. By the time you get through phase two, you pretty much know the story. If you get through that hurdle, you probably got a drug, right? And you can mm. start doing discount cash. Four out of discount. five times. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. But that's like series B in, in oh, typically, right? Could be series, series C. B. Should, wow. could be, I mean, so you'd, really you far know, down. Could be far yeah. down the line, yeah, right. If it's Series G, you're, you're, you're you know, my, <laughs> invest, dilution. my investment's flushed. I'm diluted out of existence, yeah. right? I mean, the guys that come in at that, that, that most recent round, they get all the value. So you, that's not a success. Well, yeah, what are some of that press stack stuff that happens on the biotech side? I know about some of the stuff on the B2B side. You know, typically, well, these like, days, I mean, you know, yeah. we're in nuclear winter right now for biotech and life science, right? <laughs> I mean, there's the, we haven't had a public market for, what, two years? Uh, you know, valuations are way down. Pete, nobody can, you know, it's very, very difficult to raise a venture fund. Uh, I mean, there's just all kinds of systemic problems. So yeah. pay to plays have come back um, down, you know, cram downs, down rounds. Uh, I mean, it's what's a, what's a pay to play. I mean, I, for the audience. Well, for example, you know, if, if you're an investor at an earlier stage and now the company wants to raise another round, new investors come in and say, okay, you early investors, if you want to maintain your position in this company, anything close to it, you've got to up your you've got to up your ante, right? Yeah. In the poker analogy, right? You've You're basically got to, recapping this company exactly. at a different valuation. Yeah. And if you don't want to 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 invest your pro rata share, then Mr. Investor, you're gonna own one percent of what you used to. Wow. Yeah, it's harsh. You just get flushed out. Yeah, it's very and, harsh. And they can do that, they can strong arm the cap table in this case, oh, yeah. because they're holding all the cards. This yeah, company well, needs this lifeline to survive. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get this capital infusion, the company goes out of business and you have what's zero, you know, what's, you know, 1% of nothing, right? Basically. Right. right. <laughs> so, you know, that's one of the key risks of the seed business is getting diluted out of existence. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have to select companies that minimize that risk, frankly. I mean, I yeah. can't, I can't invest in a company that needs, you know, five hundred million dollars of venture capital to get to an exit because the probability of me getting flushed out is high. Yeah, that's interesting. Because at one what, point what down the line, I'm going to have that <laughs> conversation with a, with a with a big investor like Norwest, where I used to be. Yeah, we really appreciate your hard work, but you know, once <laughs> you're finding this company and getting them to the stage, but now you're out, you're out. <laughs> right. That's really right. interesting. Thanks for all uh, your hard work. We'll take it from here. I've heard how, that. One how often before. does that happen? Is that just a kind of a market cycle thing, or is that well, uh, happens, just there's a percentage it, of time that just it's always going to happen? It happens more often in down times like this. I mean, I've been through mm. four of these downturns now in my career in business, and you know, 
when it's like this, ugly stuff happens, you know? The sharp elbows come out, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and now I'm the prey. Yeah. <laughs> Not the yeah. predator. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a, it can be a kind of a messy, sharp elbowed kind of business. Um, yeah. I love that. Yeah. In good times, you know, these things go away. Yeah. Um, but in bad times, the sharp elbows come out. That's for sure. Yeah. What about a cram down? Can you explain that for the audience? Uh, well, for example, let's say this is this has commonly happened um, in the last couple of years, right? So during the pandemic, um, there was a lot of froth. There was a lot of venture investment, right? Companies got financed at high valuations. So hundred X, yeah, yeah. hundred X, whatever. Let's say you yeah. got a company that did just did a deal two years ago at an eighty million dollar valuation. Okay. Eight zero. Yeah. Let's, let's okay. say that 80 million pre-money valuation. Now, of course they want to go out and do a, an up round, like hundred, yeah. hundred and twenty million dollar valuation. Just, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you get a term sheet from the big guys that says, all right, we'll do this deal at 30 million pre. Oof. Yeah. And everybody gets crammed down. Management, everybody. So everybody's uh, basically taking a huge dilution on their investment. So you thought you had 10% of the company, but at the new valuation, you have something like one third of what you thought. Right. So, uh, so because it's a hurts, price but, down. You know, but then again, yeah. it, you know, a lot, there are times when, hey, that beats death. It, metaphorically, I mean, you know, I mean, it, yeah. it beats having to, to pack it in and take the company bankrupt. Yeah. You know? And in biotech, that probably happens even more than B2B SaaS, right? Because in B2B SaaS, you can basically go, well... I didn't hit my milestones, but I can trim the fat and get profitable or be default alive, right? Because yeah. there's some recurring revenue. Yeah, um, you, you, there's, biotech. Well, it's like, well, we're 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 like we're, we're we're entering phase two, right? And if if we don't raise this money, we can't get through phase two, and we're right. dead. Yeah, money is the fuel in the rocket ship in life sciences. <laughs> no money, no liftoff. Would you say life sciences has bigger rewards though? Are the outcomes bigger or are they oh, I don't similar? I, I, I don't do IT, yeah. so I have no idea. Yeah. But my sense is, is that, yeah, when there's a hit, there's a big hit. I mean, you know, yeah. an $18 billion exit in a device company, you know, for example, if they're in, in, uh, in Seattle where you are, CGen was acquired for what, what was it like? I'm seven? actually technically from Seattle. I'm in California. Ah. Yeah. I'm east, east of Sacramento now. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, good to know. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I saw. That, is that Shasta behind you in the picture? No, that's Glacier Peak. That I had a cabin near oh. North Cascades National Park when I lived in Seattle, and uh, oh wow! And it was that's a hard hike to get to that place, Image Lake. That's yeah. a good. Beautiful. That's a good uh, day's scramble, but um, <laughs> it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Yeah. Well, I'd love to um, switch and do some rapid fire to wrap up, if that's all right. Sure. Um, what's one book that has profoundly impacted your life? Professionally or personally, or both? Uh, a book that's affected my life. Well, that's interesting. Probably um, some of the things I, I read at, at MIT, um, at the Sloan School. So, for example, Strategic Management by Cusmano or mm. Porter or Negotiation. I took a negotiation class from... Uh, Oh yeah, a fellow there who. So you went. To, you went to Sloan then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember my negotiation class. It was really good. Power and Politics was a really good class. I remember reading. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of great books from that class and. Yeah. Um, so so that was those were influential. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. so the art of, art of war is another one that's you know more philosophy than anything, but it applies. Always good to for a re a reread or a re listen that book because it's kind of short and just so poetic and. Uh, poignant like right. just exact exacting detail on on strategy and more strategy yeah. um and then on the science could, yeah. side things like you know the conceptual development of quantum mechanics or um you know that interface of science and philosophy which is uh, highly mathematical but highly philosophical is very yeah. interesting and relevant uh it's kind of an odd, oddball question what year do we reach longevity escape velocity? Meaning we're adding a year of life 
to our biological lives every year. Oh, that's a function of so many things. I mean, you know, telomeres, uh, cell biology, fundamental limits. I don't know. I mean, besides, would you want to live forever? I mean, <laughs> I'd want to choose, I think. Right. I would like to live forever and I would like to, I'd like to see the secrets of the universe and, and have the time and the resources to explore all different aspects of life. I'd love to like be able to go back and be a, 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 bio, a biotech engineer um, or, or a research scientist, you know, like if I had, if I knew like, oh, well, we just got some sort of breakthrough and now people are living to be hundreds of years old. I'm like, well, I got time. I got time to do whatever, you know, I want. <laughs> I could go be a DJ, make yeah. hip hop beats, and yeah. I could go, you know, like reinvent myself over and over again. It it would be nice. I I don't <laughs> think I, I think that's above my pay grade. I'm not competent <laughs> to. Uh, I mean, you need to assemble a room full of Nobel laureates to get any kind of intelligent speculation, even on that. Yeah, that's yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, what is so kind of in the same vein? What's a breakthrough in biotech you hope to see in the next decade? Or life sciences generally? Uh, well, well, what I would like to see is a solution to some of the most intractable problems in cancer. So, for example, pancreatic cancer, uh, glioblastoma, brain cancer, and ovarian cancer are the three diseases that have for decades now just eluded us. And mm -hmm. these are horrible diseases that take people in the prime of their life. And I mean, if, I mean, look. Breast cancer is a solvable problem by and large now. Right. Pancreatic is a death sentence. I mean, you get you that. It, it, it just metastasizes too quickly and just spreads too quickly, well, it's, basically. It's or? too late. So, for example, mm. I, have, I have a strong interest right now in, a, in, in finding diagnostics for pancreatic and ovarian cancer. Yeah. Because if you can catch it early, you can treat it, right? You can, yeah. you can cut out the tumor. But, I mean, for example, in ovarian, I spent three years of my life on that developing a diagnostic and the problem is you know a woman comes in her you know belly's out to here she thinks she's gained weight and in fact she's full of ascites this liquid fluid that cancer cells get off mm. and it's everywhere and oh no yeah. say your prayers it's too late you know you got six months to live it's that kind of discussion so with sad. your physician but if you could if you had a blood test where you could detect mm. a few cancer cells while they're localized then you could treat it Right. Chemo, radiation, what about, the, what about the whole body scanning? You know, I've heard of these like two or three thousand dollar. Basically, they run you through a body scan, and so they they could detect all this stuff. Yeah, actually, I it makes sense for people to do that every year. Or? Well, if you have the money, I mean, I am thinking, <laughs> I, I am thinking myself about doing this. I've had discussions with my doctor because yeah. my mother died of pancreatic cancer. Okay, in her seventies. Wow. And yeah. and and. If you could detect this using an MRI scan, and I know some examples where that has occurred. Yeah. Again, you you do a surgery. Yeah, you catch it in stage one and just okay, great. Right. Take right. It out well, and, I mean it's yeah. it's not it's not simple. I mean the Whipple yeah. surgery is the biggest surgery we have in, in in a cardiothoracic surgery. That's the one you would go to. But you got a shot of living. You don't with, with now you, you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. You got six months to live. Go go put your affairs in order. You got wow. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's crazy. So yeah, that would be a huge advance. But the trouble with those things, even the scans right now, is they gin up a whole bunch of false positives. Right. Mm. So great, you do the whole body scan. You've got thirty things chased ground. Right, and that could be very expensive. Those follow up tests. Yeah. And very frustrating to the physician, frustrating to the patient, and a lot of cost to the healthcare system, right? So it's not just a thousand bucks or fifteen hundred bucks for the MRI scan. It's the maybe ten or twenty thousand to follow all this stuff up, right? Mm. Does that make mm -hmm. sense on a population basis? Sure, it makes sense for me. Yeah, if you have the money. On, yeah, yeah, on a but on a societal level, you got to think hard about that. Yeah, but maybe what's great about technology and why I'm in tech is things get, you know, twice as good at a very predict predictable rate, right? You know, scanning technologies, you know, uh, you know, everything kind of starts becoming this information technology that, you know, we've developed better ways of doing everything. So 
maybe in the future it's pretty standard to get the yearly like whole body scan and and find stuff very early you know it it could be i mean i i have a a, a colleague in the venture business actually a very well known well known venture capitalist who is doing just this who went into stanford hospital with 5 years of longitudinal data they found something they did surgery he's got a family history nice Maybe it you makes could, sense. Could, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm. We're looking into it. I mean, I'm starting to get to that age now. You know, in my mid forties, where I'm like, okay, maybe you know, every five years, every three years, you know, whatever makes sense. And um, right, but if you're if you're following if you're every two weeks, then for the next year, following up with your doctor on false positives, you might have a different story to tell. Yes. Yeah. Because you got to wonder what the false positive rate is. Yeah. And, and it's not um, just the, the money. It's the worry. It's the time. It's the, mm. you know, you know. Oh, my yeah, God. Speaking of I worry, I, I like this question. <laughs> yeah, I like this question, which is, you know, you said six months to live. Would you rather know you have six months to live or just suddenly die? Oh, that's an interesting question. Depends. I mean, pancreatic is so painful. I think I'd rather I'd rather just die. <laughs> Instantly die. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, we we couldn't control the pain of my mother, and my my sister's a physician, oh. and you know, we had yeah. all kinds of, you know, stuff at our yeah. control. Just could not. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a horror show. What, yeah, what if it's like you know you're going to die in some day, and it's going to be painless six months from now versus? Oh yeah, of course, person. sure. I want the time, and I think you know, okay. time yeah. the time becomes more precious the less you yeah. have of it. Right. Yeah. Um. Speaking of time, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice uh, to your 20 year old self, what, what would that advice be? Uh, your finish. family's going to love this podcast someday. They're going to watch it. <laughs> uh, finish my PhD in chemistry because oh. I left with a master's degree and then went mm. to business school and so on. But in science, uh, PhD is your union card, and you really are not considered uh, a real scientist until you've attained that, that goal. How do you it, think it would have impacted your career? How, how do you think it, you know, counterfactually would have turned out different? You think you'd just still be doing what you're doing now? Or yeah, I'd be doing what I'm doing more now, confidence? but it, yeah. would, it, it, it would have opened up some more options for mm. me, I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have a master's degree in, in chemistry. I've got you know, many different continuing education courses in science and, you know, proteomics, genomics, pharmacology, immunology, and so on and so forth. But not having a PhD doing what I do is an issue. Mm, well, less of an issue now at this stage of my career, but, you know, yeah. in my 30s and 40s, yeah, it was an issue. I feel I feel that as, as a venture capitalist, a fellow VC, you know, I never had a successful exit at any of my startups. I mean, you know, I, I kind of, you know, that's, maybe my regret is not found finding founding a company that raised a bunch of capital and I had to exit. That's the one thing I haven't done, but um, I don't know if it has any bearing on my ability to allocate capital, but um, it's a regret, you know? Yeah. Well, it has bearing in terms of being able to relate to entrepreneurs, I think, and mm. get premier deal flow. Yeah. Um, you, you're just, I mean, on the West coast, you're, you're respected for having a hit, you know? It, yeah. It's just the way it is. And yeah, totally. fortunately, I did that, you know, uh, you know, sold a company in 2016 that's, you know, very successful, multi-billion dollar, 11 drugs in the clinic. And so I've got that talking point when I talk that's to awesome. people, yeah. entrepreneurs and scientists, I can say, look, I've done it. I've been there. You know, yeah. I don't want to do it again. Work 100 hours a week. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. But I can help you. It's like now I've got the cred to coach. Yeah. You Let's, have a um, play to coach. Yeah. Well, I ho hopefully some of my startups will break out and I'll be able to tell oh, yeah. a story of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure uh, they yeah. will. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's, they have you know, some, some already have, but you know, um, and I, you know, I, I, I was a product manager for years and I've built lots of products and, um, but I, yeah, I never did the, the full on founder badge of honor, you know, um, speaking of startups, what's, you know, what, let's talk about anti-portfolio. What's a startup that uh, maybe you passed on that you're like, oh, I shouldn't have, shouldn't have passed on that. Uh, shouldn't have passed on it. Yeah. Or do you have any of those or, oh, well, or maybe a, uh, she, yeah. I, <laughs> as a, well, not as a venture capitalist, but as an executive, I was asked to be after Syntex, I was asked to be the number 
uh, 15 guy at Amgen, which is now, you know, oh, wow. hundreds of billions of dollar company. Right. And I passed to be able to stay to stay in Seattle and, and, uh, you know, marry my first wife, um, that I'm divorced from longer <laughs> now. Um, yep. that wasn't a very good financial decision. <laughs> <laughs> I have one like that too. That's now, you know, worth probably close to $10 billion. I was going to be first product hire, you know, right. employee number like eight, nine, 10, something like that. Right. But you know, uh, you, and I that's mean, probably worth tens of millions of dollars right now. Should have, could have, would have, you know, and the other thing is yeah. how, how, how many milkshakes do you really need to drink? You know, <laughs> <laughs> as long as you enjoy what you're doing and what, who you're yeah, doing, right. doing right. with it, it doesn't exactly. really matter. Yeah. yeah. It's just fun to kind of, what's uh what's one habit you, that helps you stay productive? Rowing. So for me, um, maintaining very good physical condition is critical yeah. to maintain the kind of energy it takes to do these early yeah. stage things. So I've been a competitive rower now for 30 years. Oh, wow. You know, I go to Orange. You probably read Bowie's in the boat then. Oh, of course. You, oh, such a good story. Yeah. I'm a, U, I'm a UW undergrad, so I had to read it. Oh, yeah. 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 So, and I did, a good I did row when I was at UW, but I, I did after um, I went to Boston and, you know, came back. And, you, oh, you went to UW as well? Oh yeah, I, yeah. I got my I know that. my master's degree there, in chemistry. Oh, amazing! And then yeah. did a bunch of other, you know, immunology, genetics. I got my yeah. advisor in chemistry got mad at me because I was taking all these biology courses, but you know, I knew the action is at the interface of these disciplines. Chemistry is an yeah. old discipline now, right? Yeah. Well, and a lot of the breakthroughs come from cross disciplinary uh, yeah. experts, right? right. It's kind of like you can combine this with that and see it in a different way right academics is not usually very good at that they, they, they exist in silos in their departments you know right so but in drug development you've got to combine those things if um if you weren't in venture capital or biotech uh what career would you uh, pursue pursued well i'd probably be a jazz guitarist i mean i uh, oh, i love that i went to before sloan i deferred my admission for a couple of years and went to the berkeley school of music and Did played, you really? Yeah, and wow. played played music, and I, I I play now. It's just it's you know it's amazing. I, I it's a wonderful you know wonderful hobby, but yeah. a very sad profession. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know you... <laughs> what's a musician without a girlfriend? I mean, <laughs> homeless. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, or a drug addiction, you right? Know, or exactly. something. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. It's it's a it's a it's you know wonderful stuff creative but no market yeah last question uh, yeah. if you could have dinner with any scientist or entrepreneur dead or alive who would it be and why probably bob bob swanson who who um you know was the initially venture capitalist then ceo of genentech wow um yeah. so and, and why him well because he was one of the first probably maybe the first um because he I mean, he, he came out of MIT like I do, so we probably have a few things in common, that kind of worldview. And he was like the seed capitalist in a completely new industry, to boldly go where no one, no man has gone before. I mean, you're a Trekkie too. I mean, how much, how many things do we have in common? I'm rewatching uh, the Next Generation with my my teenage boys now, uh, which is awesome. You know, because yeah. I grew up, yeah, you know, I was a teenager in the '90s when Next Generation was out, and. Oh yeah, I think that's why I studied chemistry, Star Trek. You know, and, and I love that. Yeah, it was. Now I'm you watching much... any of the new series. Oh yeah, sure. They're pretty sure. good. Absolutely. Yeah. No, Star Trek is wonderful. Um, oh, that's great. And I think it's done a lot for to to popularize science um, and engineering. So yeah, I'm not the yeah, only scientist, engineer, you know, investor, entrepreneur who says says that. That's the enterprise right there. Yeah. Right at the end of my finger. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's really small. I need to get a bigger one, but yeah. Yeah, it's like probably five inches. But yeah, but I mean, you know, that 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 whole ethos of to boldly go where no man has mm. gone before is really important if you're going to take the kind of risk that we do. Mm. You know, because there are failures. There yeah. are lots of failures, but the, the key is to to, you know, cut your losses early and let your winners run. Keep investing. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I like that phrase in, in investing. Let your winners ri ride. Yeah, yeah, love that. Yeah, I mean, because if you're not failing, some to some extent, you're not taking enough risk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what that's what I tell you know people on Team Ignite. My LPs is 
hey, half of, the, half of these are going to zero. We just don't know which half. Right. <laughs> right. You know, we're going to make educated bets on, on what we believe to be true. But right. fundamentally, I mean, half this stuff is going to zero. And even more in right. biotech, it sounds like. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> well, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, there's a fair bit of living dead zombie companies. Yeah, that that's you know, definitely. You can't exit. I, I have a few of those. Uh, yep. You know, they 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 not will, growing, yeah. not exiting. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like li- it's like a life site, lifestyle business for the for the founders. Yeah, or or they become a grant mill, right? They keep and, and you can do that in life sciences, right? You keep writing grants, you keep getting, you know. 300 to a million dollars over a couple of years. Uh, there's no exit from that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a yeah. grant mill. And the thing is, same is true of, of service businesses in my sector, right? I mean, you know, we're going to sell services to the pharmaceutical industry. Great. Who's going to buy that? Very, very few companies. All right. Well, Michael, this was an amazing conversation. I, as my first, uh, you're the first life sciences uh, VC I've had on the pod, and I really appreciate you being my guinea pig and and uh, educating me and uh, being patient with my stupid questions. No, they're and not stupid sure... questions. No, I mean, <laughs> not at all. Believe me, it's this well, is hard you. stuff, and yeah. it's very different from IT investing. Yeah, it really is, and uh, that's why I had you on the pod. It was such an enlightening conversation. I'm sure the audience will get a ton of value from it. So thanks, thanks, thanks again for coming on. Sure. Happy to help. Take care. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye.